Abandoned in a small Colorado ski town, this iconic musician didn't know what to do as she watched her angry boyfriend drive away, leaving her in the cold winter. Though this was the latest in a long line of out-of-control arguments, she realized that it might be their last, which would be a real shame because he was also an iconic musician and together they were gold. Fortunately for the rest of us, this confrontation inspired a song so great, so grand, it wrote to signature status without being a hit. It wasn't even released as a single at first. So this is a tale of last chances, against the odd survival, and a song that came to symbolize all of that. Two legends that, before they were legends, almost walked away from the industry, but the song that set her back on the path. Coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if your bedroom walls were plastered with posters of your favorite guitar heroes or your favorite bands or album covers, you're going to dig this channel. Make sure that you subscribe below right now. Uh, click the red button below and check the notification box. That way you'll always know when our new interviews and videos come out. We also have a Patreon where we carry exclusive content. You can check that out in the description. So it's time for another edition of Number One in Our Hearts. This is a show that honors songs that were so unbelievably great. They absolutely should have been number one on the Billboard Hot 100. But for whatever reason, the song came up a little bit short. Previous episodes, we've covered In Your Eyes by Peter Gabriel, In the Air Tonight by Phil Collins, and Tiny Dancer by Elton John. But for today's episode, we're going to tell the story behind Landslide by Fleetwood Mac. To the landslide brought me down. So when Stevie Nicks and Lindsey Buckingham were dropped from Polydor Records in the fall of 1973, it felt like the world had ended, at least their world. That's how Stevie put it. Uh, the professional and romantic couple had thought that they had created a really brilliant debut record. It had been years of work to get to that point. But this unique blend of folk rock and country, the debut was almost immediately dismissed. In fact, some Polydor execs disliked it so much that they didn't even want to release the album. The songs they said lacked uh, imagination and had zero commercial potential. As a result, the label virtually ignored the duo, who of course went by the name Buckingham Nicks at that time. They refused to provide uh, promotional support for the release and it was a surefire setup for absolute failure. However, opinions weren't exactly positive either. Uh, Billboard dismissed the pair as a lackluster, and really they were outright ignored by music industry tastemakers. Cream, Hit Parader, and Rolling Stone. A devastated and depressed 25-year-old Stevie Nicks considered quitting music altogether. She thought about leaving L.A. to move back home with her parents. But by the start of 1974, she was still there with Lindsay. The two hadn't given up yet, so while Buckingham stayed home to write new demos for a follow-up album, Stevie went to work as a waitress. This is the job she found, uh, I believe it was at a Roaring Twenties themed restaurant that was called Clementine's, where she got to dress up in flapper attire. <laughs> she got home at six each night, and Stevie would fix dinner and straighten up the apartment before teaming up with Lindsay to work on their music at uh, nine. Typically, the duo worked deep into the night, it's often about 3 a.m. before Stevie finally crashed. And after catching some shut-eye, uh, Stevie Nicks would go back to her day job and just do it all over again. It would have been all good if they had been actually close to another record deal. But that wasn't happening. And despite Stevie's best efforts, they weren't gaining ground financially either. Uh, money got so tight that they'd often divvy up a hamburger for dinner or even share a slice of pizza. And what was worse, the constant struggle to make ends meet was wearing their relationship completely thin. Even without financial stress, Stevie and Lindsay had a volatile love affair. In fact, according to their friend and producer Keith Olsen, their relationship was always turbulent. They'd argue and things were set between the two of them that would uh, hurt each other very deeply. Not surprisingly, Lindsay spent more than a couple of nights sleeping on a living room couch uh, curled up with his guitar instead of Stevie. Then one day, toward the tail end of 1974, Lindsay received his dream call. It was a job offer to tour with none other than Don Everly of the Everly Brothers. Until 
Lindsay had always idolized that duo, but now after a falling out, Phil Everly was being replaced. Uh, Lindsay was keen to get to work and practice her songs obsessively for the six week tour. Steve even drove him to Aspen to rehearse with the band up there. While Lindsay was on tour, Stevie stayed in Aspen, you know, connecting with a girlfriend who was a local. Stevie figured that she could use this time to work on some new songs. Besides, she needed a break from her grueling routine. There, surrounded by the snow-capped Rockies and fiery fall-time colors, Stevie spent her time reading, or writing poetry, and playing with her dog, Jenny. It was a time of both emotional release and renewal, a page forever bookmarked in her history. But Stevie Nicks also thought about the rejection that uh, she and Lindsay had suffered and how their relationship was hurting because of that. Sometime later, she would recall, I was in somebody's living room, sitting cross-legged on the floor with my guitar, thinking about what to do with my life. Now, should I go back to school or should I go on pursuing a music career with Lindsay? We weren't getting along. Uh, I sat there looking out at the Rocky Mountains, pondering the, the avalanche of everything that had started to come crashing down on us. And at that moment, my life truly felt like a landslide in so many ways. Uh, end the quote. It was from these moments of mediation that the genesis of one of her most beloved songs would be born the contemplative and hauntingly beautiful landslide. Oh, mirror in the sky, what is love? Now, more on that in a minute. As we get deeper into this song, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the glasses I wear every single day. You know, with summer coming, you're going to want to go to zenny.com to design your very own pair of sunglasses. You can turn any frame into custom prescription sunglasses with Zenny's wide variety of uh, tinted lens options. Again, check that out at zenny.com. Okay, so when Lindsay finally did return to Aspen, he was in a very dark place, an angry place even. Don Everly had cut his tour short uh, when some disrespectful fans could care less about his new material and demanded that he play only his hits. Both he and Stevie were expecting a windfall of cash from that tour, but it didn't happen. Lindsay's sour mood ultimately led to yet another red-hot war of words. Feeling spiteful, he stormed out, he grabbed the dog, he took the car, and he abandoned Stevie in that frosty Colorado ski town. Uh, Stevie tearfully phoned her parents, and they sent her money to catch a flight back to L.A. But when she got there, she didn't go back home to Lindsay. Instead, Stevie turned to Keith Olsen, remember the friend and producer, who remembers Stevie pounding on his door around midnight, crying like crazy, said Olsen about it. She sat on the couch crying that she and Lindsay had had this, this major fight. I can't take it. I don't know what to do. So I just said, Stevie, if you feel this way, get it out. I got my guitar out. I handed it to her. And I said, go in the bedroom and write about it. And as Stevie sat there with her thoughts, you know, pictures of Aspen flooded into her mind. Mountains and sky and snow, pristine and bright. Fragments of poetry that she had written, they also came forward. So she started to write, letting all the pain and the disappointment of the past year just spill out. Getting fired from Polydor, uh, the daily financial stress, the job, fighting with Lindsay, and then being abandoned in Colorado in the winter. Stevie had sacrificed so much, and she had so little to show for it. Was it all worth it? Should she just give up on her dreams? Can the child within my heart rise above? Can I sail through the changing ocean tides? Sail through the changing ocean tides. Can I handle the seasons of my life? The truth was that Stevie was exhausted and beaten down from it all. And of the seasons of my life. As she thought about Lindsay, she knew things had changed between them, and she was different too. Well, I've been afraid of changing because I built my life around you. Built my life around you. But time makes you bolder. Even children get older, and I'm getting older too. Older and I'm getting older too. Stevie Nicks had a, a choice to make. Stay with a man that she loved or find a way to move on without him. Either way, she'd have to endure some, uh, some damage. 
If she stayed, there was pain and anger to work through. If she left, everything would come crashing down all around her. Both her career and her dreams at that moment were tied to Lindsay indelibly. Now, Stevie wrote she resolved to keep pressing forward. All the hard times, they had to be leading somewhere, somewhere better. The song that she would say was completed in just five minutes. But no doubt, it felt like a lifetime of experiences went into this song. It was her resolution not to quit. For the moment, it was addressed to herself. But in time, the world would sing it too. This girl was not giving up on her dreams. And when Stevie woke Keith up at 8 a.m. the next morning, she said, I think I came up with something. As she played in the song, <laughs> he was blown away. Holy crap, the melody, the sentiment, the chorus, it was perfect, is what he would say. I took my love, took it down. Through all the ups and downs of her music career, Stevie was really fortunate to have supportive parents, even if they didn't always understand. But for years, they had watched her uh, struggle through poverty, and depression, sickness, and a tumultuous relationship with Lindsay, all in pursuit of her dreams. Couldn't have been easy to see that. It was around this time after learning about Stevie's latest struggles that her father, Jess, visited her in L.A. He was actually pretty shocked to see how thin she had gotten and unhappy that she seemed at that moment. A worried for her physical and mental health, Jess Nick strongly suggested that Stevie set a deadline for herself. It'd give her six more months. If things didn't uh, turn around by then, you know, come home and go back to college. I mean, at least at home, she could get uh, the much needed financial relief. This was very hard for Stevie to, to even consider quitting music. It was her dream. And she and Lindsay were literally living out the starving musician cliche. So reluctantly, as Stevie agreed to that timetable, but what this deadline did, along with her recent manifesto landslide, was just the motivation that Stevie needed. She was confident that she could make it in the music business. Her eyes ablaze with fire, Stevie confronted Buckingham at the apartment and said, you know what, Lindsay, let's go. Let's do this. Now, even though Stevie moved back in, the stress of the past few years was still there. The fighting and harsh words just got worse, and what was once a loving partnership had almost completely unraveled. <laughs> Lindsay and Stevie were on the verge of breaking up for good. And then something miraculous happened. Mick Fleetwood of Fleetwood Mac wanted them to join his band. It was towards the end of, uh, of 1974. Mick Fleetwood was looking for a new recording studio when he visited Keith Olsen at Sound City. Mick Fleetwood came in to try and find a studio and a co-producer for his new album, is what Keith remembered. I played him some things that I'd done, and I played him the song, Frozen Love by Buckingham Nicks. Lindsay and Stevie both happened to be in the building at this time, very same time he was there. And uh, Lindsay's ears perked up when he heard uh, that their song was playing really loudly in the neighboring studio. So he went to check it out, and he was surprised to see this really tall guy stomping his feet, is what he said, to their song. Mick loved it and was particularly impressed by Buckingham's guitar work. Plus, uh, through the glass, he caught sight of a stunning Stevie Nicks who made quite an impression on him. More on that <laughs> down the road. Mick would take some time to think about it, but when he had... He told Keith he wanted to book the studio for their next album. Now, as fortune would have it for Nicks and Buckingham, uh, Fleetwood Mac's guitarist Bob Welch, he decided to uh, part ways with the band. This left Fleetwood Mac in a predicament. Without a guitarist, their new album would have to be postponed. So I believe it was the last day of 1974, December 31st. Mick called up Olsen and he said, I've got good news and bad news. Bob Welch has left the band and we won't be able to start the album in February. Uh, Keith was thinking, crap, I'm out of work. I won't be able to pay my rent or my car payment. What's the good news? And uh, you know that guitar player is what Mick said. Would he be interested in joining my band? Keith told him that Lindsay might, but that he was part of a set. Where he went, so did Stevie. After the call, Keith dropped by to visit Lindsay and Stevie, who were having a New Year's Eve get-together. For the next five hours, he tried to convince him 
for all of their sakes to join Fleetwood Mac. By 2 a.m., Buckingham and Nix tentatively agreed. You know, maybe just for a month or two is what they first thought. After Keith left, Lindsay and Stevie were still skeptical, though Lindsay was the more reluctant of the two. He was convinced Buckingham Nix was on the brink of real success with their follow-up album. He was like, the record's happening. This record is happening. That's what Stevie remembered. She said, yeah, it is, but we are dirt poor and I don't want to be a waitress anymore. The more she thought about it, the more she realized that this could be their big break. So as soon as she could scrounge up enough change, Stevie bought all of the Fleetwood Mac records that she could find. And uh, she was pleasantly surprised to discover that she genuinely liked their music. She liked this band. A short time later, she and Lindsay met the members of Fleetwood Mac uh, at a Mexican restaurant for dinner. In addition to the newcomers, uh, the soon-to-be legendary lineup included, of course, Mick Fleetwood on drums, of course, Christine and John McVie. Uh, suffice to say, it was a good dinner. Said Mick, The thing that's funny about that meeting is that we weren't really auditioning them. They, uh, Lindsay especially, they were auditioning us. But once we sat down together at that table, I knew something was there. I knew I'd made the right choice. I saw no reason to hold back. So after shooting a glance at John and Christine, Mick asked Nix and Buckingham, so would you like to join our band? And their answer was yes. And from there on out, the two bands were one. Lindsay and Stevie just didn't join Fleetwood Mac. They brought their Buckingham Nix identity into the fold fully intact. And even though Stevie and Lindsay would continue to struggle through a turbulent relationship, in that moment, they had been brought back from the brink. Said Stevie, I got an apartment on Hollywood Boulevard and he moved back in with me and we kind of put our relationship back together for the time being. Things were better between us. We weren't fighting about money. We had a really nice place and we were going to work with these hysterically funny English people every day making great music. For the time being, all was well in the world. And as for that impending deadline, you know, Stevie's father had set. Nix beat it by a long shot. It was time to call her parents and tell them the good news that her dreams were finally coming true. Now, weeks later, Fleetwood Mac was in the studio recording the band's second self-titled album, also known as the White Album. Uh, of course, Lindsay and Stevie didn't show up empty-handed, mind you. Uh, Buckingham brought the tracks Monday morning, uh, I'm So Afraid. He also co-wrote World Turning with Christine McVie. Stevie contributed uh, Rhiannon, Crystal, and of course, Landslide. Of the album's 11 tracks, the Buckingham Knicks duo brought in half of those. Really was a, a merging of two amazing bands. The album is recorded between January and June 1975 at Sound City Studios in Van Nuys, uh, California. Fleetwood Mac and Keith Olsen are both credited as producers. And by Fleetwood Mac's standards, the process actually went very smoothly. The White Album was released on uh, July 11th, 1975. Singles included Over My Head, Warm Ways, Rhiannon, and uh, Say You Love Me. Landslide was not released as a single, but as Fleetwood Mac's popularity grew, so did Landslide's. Well, I've been of Two decades later, it would achieve even greater notoriety when the band released their live reunion album, The Dance. That was, of course, on August 19, 1997. It was the first time Fleetwood Mac's Fab Five had released an album together since 1987's Tango in the Night. The album went to number one on the Billboard 200 album chart and spawned three singles, The Chain, Silver Springs, and Landslide. 
of which the latter was released in uh, 98. Dance's version of Landslide reached number 51 on the Billboard Hot 100 and uh, went to number 10 on the AC chart, to number 21 in Canada. Uh, it marked a resurgence for the fans' favorite album cut, which continues to this day to be one of the most beloved songs from the 70s. Oh, in the sky, what is love? Landslide has appeared in so many movies and TV shows. Uh, there was Jack Frost in 98, Jersey Girl in 2004, Cold Case. One Tree Hill, Glee in 2011, The Blacklist in 2020, and Supergirl in 2021. Landslide, also some great covers. Smashing Pumpkins did it in 94, Tori Amos in 96, the Chicks in 2002. in 2011. Harry Styles just did it. I build my life around you. Miley Cyrus and Justin Furstenfeld the Blue October have also covered it. Afraid of changing cause I Stevie Nicks has continually dedicated Landslide to her parents, actually. Many times just to her father, which has led to speculation by many that the song was written about him, or about them. Landslide isn't specifically about her father, but Stevie has shared that of all the songs she's written or performed over the years, this is her dad's personal favorite. And uh, ever since that fateful night at Keith Olsen's apartment where Landslide virtually fell out after five minutes of contemplation by Stevie, the song has stretched, it's evolved and deepened in the years that have followed. In recent years, Stevie's performances of this song have been a highlight of, of any of their live shows or her personal live shows. It's as if Stevie is watching back over her life from the perspective of an older and wiser being. She draws her conclusions, her wonderment, and affection over the trials that she's overcome and the journey that she's taken, honoring those who have been a light on that path, most specifically her mother and father. And we have been so fortunate to be there as spectators to this beautiful, beautiful odyssey. Bring it down. Leave us a comment about Fleetwood Mac and Landslide. What are your memories of this song? Let us know in the comments below. If you like this episode, we got plenty more where that came from about Fleetwood Mac. Check out our shows on Dreams, I've Done the Chain, and Go Your Own Way. Also, if you haven't already, take a moment to subscribe. We, we'd love to have you as part of our community to help us keep the music alive. That is the most important mission that we're on. Until next time, three chords. And the truth, my friends.